Hello and welcome to this week's episode of Dada's Show coming to you from Best Western Hotel here in Upper Hill, Nairobi. I'm your host, Ashiko Mbune. Now, Dada's Show aspires to promote the spirit of solidarity and sisterhood amongst Kenyan women. And we do this by creating an open and a safe platform for women to be able to discuss issues ascertaining to their life, to their careers, to anything that affects Kenyan women. And of course, we introduce a group of diverse women every week to discuss issues uh, pertaining to women of Kenya. Now, we recently celebrated the International Day of Older Persons, which was on the 30th of September. September. Now, we had dedicated a whole episode to shining a, a light on the plight uh, of older persons in the country. And of course, through your contribution and those of subject matter experts, we were able to discuss issues and we were able to find certain issues that we can be able to narrow down to. So on today's episode, we shall be digging deeper and understanding dementia. Dementia is a condition that has the capability to affect somebody's life. And and how they are able to function. One of the key risk factors for dementia is old age, meaning as you get older and as you age, then you become more susceptible to the condition. So today I am joined by uh, subject matter experts and people like you and me who have interacted with the condition. They're going to shine a light on, on this condition. What are some of the symptoms that we should be looking out for? What, what is the treatment? How do you even cope with it? Or both on a physical and a psychological level. And of course, we, at ho we encourage you at home to join us on this and any other episode give us your feedback share with us what you think share with us topics that you feel like we should touch on that affect the lives of each and every woman here within our lovely country as always get in touch with us on our social media platforms at kbc channel one and you can also reach me on my personal page which is ashiko the host across all social media platforms so before we get started let's take a look at the following feature Dementia is a progressive disease that destroys memory and other important mental functions. Although symptoms are many, memory loss and confusion are among the main symptoms. No cure exists, but medication and management strategies may temporarily improve symptoms. Ten of the most common warning signs are memory loss, difficulty performing familiar tasks, problems with language, disorientation to time and place, poor or decreased judgment, problems keeping track of things, misplacing things, and changes in mood and behavior. For most people with Alzheimer's who have the late onset variety symptoms first appear in their mid-60s or later, when the disease develops before age 65, it's considered early onset Alzheimer's, which can begin as early as a person's 30s, although this is rare. In most cases, dementia is not inherited by children and grandchildren. Welcome back. So if you're just joining us, our topic of discussion today is understanding dementia. And of course, like I mentioned, we are joined by a group of wonderful ladies who have interacted with the condition uh, one in one way or another. We also have subject matter experts who are going to shine a light on this particular condition that uh, that was one of the issues that were picked, up, picked out uh, when we were discussing the plight of the older persons. So of course, joining me today on my panel is uh, right next to me is Dr. Tasnim Taz uh, Yamani, who is a medical doctor. Karibu sana Tasnim. Uh, next to her, we have uh, Madam Elizabeth Mutunga, who is the founder of Alzheimer's and Dementia Organization Kenya Adoc. Welcome. And then next to her, we have a familiar face in most of our screens. Her name is Karemi Njaki, who happens to be an actress. She's also a farmer, and of course, she's a carer. And then finally, uh, in our audience, we have a very key member of our panel, and her name is Sarah Karaoke, and she is a counseling psychologist. Thank you so, so much, ladies, for making time to join us. Of course, I cannot fail to acknowledge my wonderful audience who take time week in, week out to come and sit and listen to conversations and contribute to conversations. I truly appreciate you. So to get the ball rolling, I'll start with you, Dr. Um, we are going on and on about dementia, dementia, dementia. 
uh, what, how can you define, let's just go down to the basics, how can you define dementia and how does it occur? Okay, so for starters, my name is Dr. Tasneem. I'm a geriatric GP mm -hmm. and I'm a director at Hamath Healthcare. Um, what I do on a day-to-day -day is take care of older persons and home visits. So why that is key to mention is so that I can explain what dementia is to you better yes. on a very day-to-day -day living. Mm -hmm. So it's not too technical for you. So dementia is basically a decline in your cognitive function. Now, when I say cognitive, I know I'll get the question, what is cognition? Yes. Cognition is different levels of your daily living, your learning, your memory, your thinking capability, your social interaction, your language functions. So any decline in any of those fields, which is a lot more complex than one or two, before we think it needed to be more than one, but now we know any decline in any of those areas mm -hmm. comes under the broad spectrum of dementia. Yes. Um, you asked the second question about how it occurs. Mm -hmm. How it occurs is unknown because every dementia cause or type has a different what we call pathophysiology yeah. under it. Yes. And I know there's a lot of times, most of the times we use the word dementia together with other conditions and mm -hmm. it gets confusing. I'm sure we'll talk about that a bit later. Yes. But dementia is an overall umbrella of all cognitive declines okay. and it has many different causes. Mm -hmm. Infections can cause dementia, brain disorders can cause dementia, having a brain injury can cause dementia, having Parkinson's can cause dementia, getting a stroke can cause dementia and the list is endless. Now, Elizabeth, you're the founder of Alzheimer and Dementia Organization of Kenya, ADOC. And I'm curious, share with us, um, you've also interacted with the condition. So share with us your journey and, and what the inspiration was behind the formation of ADOC. Thank you very much. My name is Elizabeth Mtunga. As you mentioned, I'm the CEO and founder of Alzheimer's and Dementia Organization Kenya, an organization that started out of a need to understand the condition first because my dad got it when I was 17 mm -hmm. in the 90s. So I know some of you are already calculating how old I am. <laughs> <laughs> but we did not <coughs> understand what it was. And a lot of times it looked like a mental health issue. Mm -hmm. And we kept thinking maybe it's because he is not, he had just been retrenched. So I think maybe that is what is causing it. But also we had lost a sister in the process mm -hmm. of him being retrenched. But what started showing, uh, looking different was he moved us from a four bedroom machinate house to a Mabati house around the corner. And he's telling us, Jesus is coming, we don't need all these things. And our things, today it rains, tomorrow it dries up. So things are just getting messed up. My dad was a policeman and a senior policeman. He was an OCS. Yes. So already, he already had a standing in the society. But now he's doing things that do not make sense mm -hmm. at all. And so it took us so long to even try and understand what he's doing. So finally, when I was just completing my fourth form, he told my younger sister that uh, she cannot go to school because girls don't go to school. They need to wait for their husbands to come for them. Mm -hmm. And we're thinking, you just take, took me to high school. And here you are saying that my sister cannot go to high school. Yeah. And it didn't make sense still. Mm. So we continued like that. So we start noticing he's wearing his, he loved counter suits. And then he would wear pajamas on top. Mm -hmm. Or he would walk out and he's selling the car in parts. And so he sells the tires of the car alone, the rest of the body of the vehicle alone. And you're thinking, What's this going is not on? normal. Yeah. This is not normal. This yes. is not the pa kind of person we used to know. Mm -hmm. Because my dad is one of those people who would pay your school fees even for a whole year. And so we, he continued just deteriorating. He would, instead of taking a matatu, he would start walking. Mm -hmm. So that started telling us there's a problem. So, but every time we would go to hospital because he had diabetes, would only talk about his diabetes, but not talk about what we are noticing. Mm -hmm. And as we continued, it reached a point even told me, I am not his child, he's never had children. And so it was just many things that mm. did not make sense. Mm. Finally, in 2007, we went to see a doctor. And when we explained this time, I think we were so frustrated as yeah. a family. Yeah. So we brought out the issue of his memory loss and telling us we, we are not his children. Mm. And because even I had already gotten married by then, and on my wedding day, he, he, as he was supposed to walk me down the aisle, he said, I'm not your father. And I'm thinking, this oh is not dear. the day to tell me that yeah. you are not my not father. Now, yeah. And so, so the doctor, I think we were at the point we were now very frustrated. Mm -hmm. And so we told the doctor what's been happening. And the doctor just said, it sounds like dementia go and read about it, there's no cure. That is how we got the news. Oh so for me, I was like, it took us 15 years to actually get a diagnosis. And I was like, I wouldn't want anyone else 
to go through that journey without understanding exactly what they're looking for or understanding what's going on. And that is how ADOC came about. Wow. Yeah. I mean, that's really, that, I mean, I, 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 I empathize with uh, what you went through as a family for you to wait for 15 years before you get a diagnosis. And this is someone who, let's say prior to before you were 17 years old, was ordinary. And so all of a sudden the, ch the behavior change and all of this lifestyle changes. So, wow, I mean, that's a lot. I mean, I commend you because you turned, you were able to turn, you know, lemons into lemonade. And I'm sure that you're a resource center in itself for anyone who's going through that. So Karimi, share with us your journey and your interaction with uh, dementia or Alzheimer's. Yeah. Well, um, thank you, Ashiko. So I interacted with Alzheimer's from say 2012. My late father was diagnosed in 2018. And what had happened before that, well, he, he was a judge of the High Court of Kenya. Yes. And he was retrenched. And he, he suffered from depression. So initially, that is what he was being treated for. Mm -hmm. But now, when we think about it now, even prior to his being retrenched, there were some things that we'd started noticing. Mm -hmm. Like, he'd be looking for his glasses, yeah? And he'd get very agitated because he can't find the glasses. And he'd tell me, help me look for my glasses. Mm -hmm. So I'd look for them and tells me, no, you're not looking properly, look for them. And I continue looking for the glasses. Then I tell him, uh, Dad, let's go to the mirror. He says, I don't want to go to the mirror, I want my glasses. Give me back my glasses. I'm like, no, no, let, let's just go to the mirror. And his glasses are on his face. Oh, they're on his face? Yes. Oh, dear. And the car keys go missing, then he'd laugh it off and say, oh, no, I'm just growing old. Yeah. So initially it was kind of cute. Mm. And well, like, these are the things that happen. Yeah, it Nikubeka. just happens, yeah. yeah. And mm -hmm. then we even laugh at him. Mm. Oh, you forgot your keys. But then we started noticing other things like he's driving and he just stops in the middle of the road. Mm -hmm. And he does not know why he has stopped. And he started becoming quite aggressive also. As he struggled to remember things, he became become quite aggressive. Mm -hmm. So he was being treated for depression, as I've said. Mm -hmm. But at some point, I'd look at him and I'd be like, I, I hope this is not Alzheimer's disease. Mm -hmm. So in my mind, I was like, ah, but dad can't have Alzheimer's. Because mm -hmm. I'm remembering that TV program. Yeah. Saying, I, Alzheimer's is for rich Mzungu men, mm -hmm. old ones who live in nice suburbs. My father is not a Mzungu man. Yeah. And we don't live in a suburb anyway. So I kept thinking, no, no, this cannot be an African thing. Mm. But somewhere at the back of my mind, I was like, maybe it is Alzheimer's. And I started doing my research from that time. And I started seeing it could be Alzheimer's. So, and my mom was also very suspicious. Fortunately, my mom is a retired nurse. Yeah. So she was able to pick some of these symptoms. So the next time they went to see the psychiatrist, because, well, he was being treated for depression. For depression, yes. And the thing is, he had resisted going to hospital because he's going to see a psychiatrist. Mm -hmm. He knows psychiatrists treat crazy people, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. Another misconception about mental health. Yes. And he kept saying, I am not insane. So anyway, eventually, my mom wore him down and he started seeing the psychiatrist. He's being treated for dementia, I mean for depression. And so one day we told the doctor, this is what we've been noticing. Mm -hmm. And he recommended an MRI, mm -hmm. and sure enough, uh, he had Alzheimer's, which at that point was actually quite advanced. Yeah. Because his brain had already detached from the cortex. Thank you so, so much, Karimi. That is truly inspirational. And I want us to continue debunking, you know, the process of how you found out, how you were able to, the diagnosis, the treatment, and how you were able to deal with it till date. Tell us a little bit about the infections that cause dementia, because we did mention earlier on that, you know, aging is a, is a risk factor. But if there's an infection that can cause, I mean, what are some of those ones, Things just like briefly? Things like HIV can cause dementia. Mm -hmm. So anything that affects your brain structure can cause a dementia. Mm -hmm. Having a road traffic accident with a head injury can lead to a dementia. Mm -hmm. So there are all those kind of dementias that come around. Mm -hmm. Some kind of deficiencies like a vitamin D deficiency can lead to a dementia. Mm -hmm. So there are different nutritional factors that can lead to dementias, not necessarily because you didn't take it. They're always in association with other things. Okay. Yes.
thank you so much. That's really well put. And I think it's very encouraging, even for people at home, to read widely and very broadly in regards to certain conditions, especially like this one. Because I think all along, I always used to think uh, dementia and Alzheimer's, you know, those are very different, very, I think even when I was, it's only until I was doing research for this show that I said, oh, dementia looks like the umbrella and uh, Alzheimer's is part of it. It's a type of dementia. Oh, in your own individual cases, or let's start with you, Elizabeth, in your individual case, and of course, with the cases that you have dealt with at ADOC, what were some of the telltale signs uh, that your loved one has or give an indication that there is dementia? I think one of the things that stood out for us was the memory. Mm -hmm. So him forgetting, like Dr. Red mentioned, your short-term memory is all wiped out. So he's telling us things that he used to do in the when he was younger, mm -hmm. because sometimes it's like their mind stops where they were in their late teens, early 20s. Yes. So he would wake up in the middle of the night and he's telling my mother, get out of my room. I am planning to get married. What are you doing in my room? Because he forgot mm. that he actually is married and he has children. Waking up to ask us, Who's ch if I'm your father, how can I forget you? So stop calling me dad. Mm. And then also he would now f start telling us about people who are long gone. And, we are th and he's talking to them like they're right there with him getting lost and wandering away he would just walk away and he would never remember if he finds the lock the gate locked he will not be able to now open like the latch to come in because for him he'll stand there for like five minutes get irritated he doesn't know what to do and he starts walking so a number of times he did that we found he took a ferry crossed over to the other side of diani fell because he also had diabetes mm. the other thing that we used to notice is that now not remembering the day and time so he's uh, waking up on a Tuesday, he wants to go to church, and it's supposed to be on Sunday when he's supposed to go to church. Uh, and then also small things, like he would get very irritated and also going to the bank. That mm. was another thing that he would go all when the time. Know what's, what's the story? I think, do, you, do you feel like in terms of society, sorry, it's a slight segue, society in, in, in embracing some of these conditions, they should always have a room or somewhere, someone yes. stand by? Because if we've been able to denote that both in both cases, the bank, shouldn't that bank have a room somewhere with a counselor or some, That's some the snacks? Thing. And I don't think they understand because he looks normal yeah. when he walks into the bank. Yeah. So unless you people who know him notice that there's a change and then he'll go and usually it's not that they withdraw little money. It's usually a lot of money. Oh dear. It's a lot of 100,000 usually and over. And they do not know what to do with that kind of money. So what do they go doing? giving it out. Then he comes yes. home and says we stole from him and we become thieves, we are branded thieves, we have to kneel in the middle of the night to be prayed for. So those are some of the symptoms. <laughs> yeah. Because he's saying I'm not going to bring up thieves. Yeah. But he, so the house where we were living, remember I told you he moved us from a four bedroom machinate house to a Mabati house. Mm. <laughs> so when we're moving from this Mabati house, the same thing about holding. So he had these small tissues. There's also something about them and tissues. And so he had so many small tissues. Do you remember all the money we were beaten and called thieves about? Yeah. It was in all these small tissues. Oh, yeah. So there was so much money. No, but he didn't know what money was then. So I'm like, honestly, this is the fight. So but the, the money, money was, was right the there, hidden so nicely, but he forgot oh my. where he hid the money. What about you, Karimi? What are some of the telltale signs that you experienced the sheriff? Um, my dad's personality changed mm -hmm. like overnight. Mm -hmm. My dad was a very, very generous man. Yeah. I mean, he put um, kids through school mm -hmm. who were not even relatives or whatever. Then suddenly, he's holding like onto 10, he always had 10,000 shillings cash in his wallet and he'd spent time counting it like a miser. The prepaid electricity tokens. Yes. He had a full cup where he used to write the number of units we've used in a day. So at, in the morning when he wakes up, he'll he go check. To confirm. Yes. At night when he's going to sleep, he will write again. The number of yes. units. Yes. And yeah. in the morning, he'll ask who was using electricity when I was asleep. Oh dear. <laughs> like when he goes to sleep, electricity should not be used. Everything should be turned Everything off. Everything should be switched like off. Too. <laughs> yes. Oh my. And then, um, yeah. always saying, I want to go see my mother. Yeah. Yeah. And he's going <coughs> home. He's going home. And one day I told him, Dad, your mother died in 2013. Mm. Big mistake. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because I also didn't know how to deal with this sort of situation. Mm -hmm. 
and he broke down all over again. It's like he's so gone back he, to the day. He got re-traumatized. I mean, yes. so he was starting with the whole griefing process again. Okay. Yeah, and then also, I don't know, he just got this affinity for little children. Mm. Yeah? He'd see children playing, and he'd stop the car. He wants to go and join them. Oh. I don't know if at that point he was thinking he's still in, he's in nursery school or what it is, mm. but children just used to fascinate him. Mm. The times, I mean, you'd have to stop him because, I mean, someone might start screaming that you, you want to abduct the child. Yeah. You know how it is. Yeah. But so that's the fixation. So of course there's now, we've talked about fixation, we've talked about, we've talked about, uh, you know, memory loss, you know, the changes in habits. So at least I, I hope you in my audience and also at home, you're trying to see a pattern, even though before we start going into to dig deeper, what's, what's the psychological impact of, um, of some of these uh, conditions to family members and their caregivers? What I would say is confusion. I think that's the word that comes to mind first, confusion. Because, and it's confusion both for the patient first and also for the family members. Because really, you have no idea what is going on. Mm -hmm. You can imagine, you as the observer, you're observing these uh, small details. Now I'm thinking what is going on inside the mind of this person who knew themselves a certain way, but they're not able to, to function as that person. Okay. So that's bound to uh, bring about a lot of anxiety. Mm -hmm. So anxiety is a major one um, when you're dealing with dementia and any sort of a condition that impairs cognitive functioning, even depression, mm -hmm. even something like de clinical depression or clinical anxiety. The fact that you're not functioning at your optimum level, what you know yourself to be, breeds a lot of anxiety inside the person and frustration. Mm -hmm. So the aggression that you'll observe uh, in a patient living with that is born out of the frustration that I know I was, I can function up to this point, but something is impeding mm -hmm. my functioning. So that will brew severe anxiety. And um, if you observe, uh, there'll be a lot of um, tears, Sometimes there's a lot of crying, even to someone who was toic, you know, and strong, mm -hmm. suddenly is reduced to an emotional, you know, a very emotional person, yeah. temperamental almost. Mm -hmm. It's because of that anxiety and frustration. Then there's a regression. That regression is major because um, loss of short-term working memory, when you think about it, is major. Yeah. It's really a major thing because you run your day-to-day -day based on your short-term working memory, yes. not your long term. Mm -hmm. It is a, it's a, we call it executive functioning. Mm -hmm. That's what runs your life. So loss of that is really loss of your humanness. What you understand yourself to be as a yeah. human being. And now you're being reduced to long term memory. So that's why you see them going back to behaving like a child, yeah. wanting to associate with children. That's regression. Um, dressing a funny way, that's regression. So I, I, I can only imagine the frustration inside that person mm. at having to rely on, you know, what was. And the miser behavior, they've gone back to a time when they didn't have much, yeah. where, depending on the background of the person. So they have lost the sense of where they had reached or who I am today. I have gone back to who I was. So if I grew up in poverty, then suddenly I live like I don't have. Mm -hmm. Okay, mm -hmm. that must be very frustrating for the individual. Mm -hmm. Now, how about the family members? Yes. You can imagine by the time you wrap your mind around... This is happening. That this is happening. Yeah. So first, you're injured inside you, you know, because of the treatment this person um, is giving you. This is your father. Really, it's a person you've adored your entire life. And suddenly they've turned against... It feels like they've turned against you. Mm -hmm. That's bound to hurt. Okay, mm -hmm. so there'll be... Again, confusion in the family members, there'll be frustration, there'll be anger, and there'll be a deep sense of loss, mm -hmm. a very deep, I think it's worse than death yeah. sometimes. Yeah, because the person is yeah. there. Yeah. You see, the, the physical departure of somebody yeah. some, gives you somewhat closure. But when somebody is there yeah. and they're not there, yeah. I think so you have to deal with it every single day. And not only are they not there, but mm. they're hurting you. 
they're hurting you while they're at it. Yeah. So you're being rejected. Yes. You're being you're abandoned. Uh, exactly. You oh dear. So mm. you're abandoned. You're mm. rejected. You're having to fend for yourself mm. if you're still a dependent like Elizabeth was. Yeah. So you're having to figure out things that you had taken for granted would be taken care of. Mm. You can imagine what that does to the family members. Mm -hmm. And more often than not, the family members will feel like they are falling apart. Yes. Before they can come to rallying around to, to figure out a way forward, they'll be flung away, you know, because no one really knows. And, and because the information is not there, there's even no one to tell you, guys, this is what you're going through. Mm. This is what it means. Yeah. So before you can figure out, okay, we need to figure out what's going on. Mm -hmm. You've both, you've, all of you have had to deal with it your own way. Yeah. So probably you're already enemies in the family you've turned against each other because you have, yeah. nobody really ta you know brought you together so your mother doesn't want to see you your, your brother thinks this your sister and so on and so forth mm. so that um compounds the yeah. whole problem and the caregiving aspect of mm. this patient because mm. as we are fighting as we are trying to find our way the patient is getting worse eh? yeah yeah so by the time now we rally around like okay so let's get together and do something mm. the patient has deteriorated so mm. now we have an even bigger problem than where we started off where at started so can from. you see how it, it's i mean it's yeah. the the impact is 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 in leaps and bounds on both the patient and definitely the family members and of course this is this is to you at home you know like um, like our psychologist has mentioned today if the confusion anxiety frustration anger um uh, this are part of the things that you should be feeling so do not people have a tendency of trying to camouflage what they're feeling so we're getting it from a professional that if that is what you're feeling right now then it is okay it is okay to feel like that but of course one of the challenges that we have talked about is the fact that the family is fighting people have minimum knowledge etc i know that's one of the key challenge so let me jump straight to you um elizabeth what are some of the key challenges that you have experienced on an individual le level and also as the founder of uh, ADOC in terms of the challenges that you experience when it comes to dealing with this condition. That's very interesting that we are actually speaking after Sarah because mm -hmm. what she pointed out about families mm -hmm. are so torn apart. Mm -hmm. You are called for a family meeting actually to be a mediator because families cannot even meet eye to eye. Yeah. Like we say with Joyce all the time, there are those who throw the money on the table mm -hmm. so that they can sort the problem. There are those ones who are there to deal with the problem. So a lot of times it, they scream at each other and you just have to sit and let them be. Mm. Let them say everything that they need to. Then after that, now you bring them together. Mm. A lot of them still will not believe that it is dementia. Others will think, no, we need to seek third, fourth, fifth opinion, mm -hmm. which of course costs money. But they, at this point, they are thinking, this one who's speaking all the time is the one actually who is daddy's favorite so there must be something they are doing together another thing that is also the doctors they go and see mm. so they go see this doctor who just slaps them with they have medication. dementia mm. medication also especially if they've gone to see a psychiatrist mm -hmm. with all due respect to the psychiatrist but they're given such strong doses that they just sit there yet they can be doing so many things still in their life because when you are uh, diagnosed with dementia it doesn't mean that your life stops yes it does not stop but also families because they also do not know what to go and ask for mm -hmm. so you're given this medication and your loved one just sits there like a zombie the whole day and by the time you're coming round to us we, we are trying to tell you no we think this is how you should have started all together so there's a lot of hope because people still feel I mean who are you to tell us mm. <laughs> and you're like okay I'm speaking from uh, Experience, experience point of view experience. but i had to go to yeah. school again to do dementia because a lot of people think you don't know you're speaking from what even the medics themselves mm. so that we have a lot of family fights a lot of not understanding what their condition is mm -hmm. a lot of people still thinking it's witchcraft mm -hmm. and you must have done something wrong to the gods and that's why you're getting pa mm -hmm. punished a lot of us like us in our family we're told we're secret sinners mm -hmm. that is why god is slapping us <laughs> with what we are with going, what through. going through so yeah. a lo so you also debunk a lot of Christianity myths and all that and mm -hmm. just tell people it's a condition you didn't ask for it it came to you as a family and just having the other thing that has also helped a lot of caregivers is a support group mm -hmm. coming to realize I'm not alone mm -hmm. there are many other people going through this a lot of people walk in and they're like huh oh, I know like Hadao can share. When she walked in, she was like, Hush just read about us on Facebook. Yeah. And she didn't know there was a big community out there. Because a lot of people, because 
it being uh, dementia, there's a lot of stigma. Of so we, it's hush hush. You will not come and tell me my loved one is pooping in front of our sitting room. You want to hide that because of course the dignity of the person. But once you hear somebody else say it and they're refusing to shower, they're refusing to eat. So things that you go daily and it's a daily struggle, you come and realize I'm not alone. I can hold somebody else's hand. So those are some of the challenges we've actually wow. seen. I mean, I like how you put it, and I think sometimes it, 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 it has a very close tie-in with lack of information. And I think that's, that's primarily what we are doing here today uh, for our viewers who are joining us. We're having a discussion on dementia, and we're trying to understand dementia so that we can be able to debunk some of the myths. So, and speaking of debunking some of the myths and misconceptions, we've heard about the challenges. Karimi, tell me about some of the myths and misconceptions and perhaps some of the challenges you've experienced. We also heard it was witchcraft. Mm -hmm. There was also the religious angle of it all. It was also, no, there's nothing wrong with him. He's just bored, mm. you know, because he's come from this very busy job and all that. Mm. Or, no, 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 they're just not taking care of him. He's mm. fine. Yeah? But you do not know the struggles that we as a family are actually going through. Yeah. And then, yes, as I said, it started with depression. And as Elizabeth has said, he was being treated for depression by psychiatrists. But now when we went with the other symptoms is when now we are referred to a neurologist. Mm -hmm. Yeah? And, well, fortunately, my mom really tried to shield a lot of what was going on out there because she, she's a nurse. She knows exactly what it is. But, and some of the other challenges we also faced was the medical. Because you'll find that our national health cover does not cover dementia. Really? No, they don't. NHIF does not cover dementia. So everything is coming out of pocket. Mm. Everything. But fortunately, and man, I, I just have to thank God for the Retired Judges Association of Kenya. When they came home and they asked us what our, one of our biggest challenges was, and we told them the medical, and they said, no, no, wait. The retired judges has a, have a medical cover uh -huh. that is still the same as sitting judges. Oh, wow. So at least they sorted out, us out with that. Mm -hmm. So after that, his, all his medical was taken care of. Mm. The other thing with um, Alzheimer's and dementia that people don't realize is that there are also these other costs that come in that you're not aware of. Mm -hmm. Adult diapers, and they're not cheap. Diet. Sometimes... Because as the brain, basically the brain is dying. Mm. I can talk about Alzheimer's. So as the brain dies, so that do certain functions die. So you'll find that maybe someone cannot chew the food anymore. So you have to blend it for them. Not everybody can afford a blender. Mm. Not everybody has, even has electricity. We've seen cases where people with dementia are tied to their beds by mm. their loved ones. Mm because they don't understand what is going on. Mm -hmm. They do not have the resources to even take this person to hospital for diagnosis. Mm -hmm. And you have to go do whatever it is. And, you, and for, you'll find a lot of this in the rural areas mm -hmm. and informal settlements. Mm -hmm. So you just find this person sitting in their waist. They've been tied to the bed the whole day because their family has to go earn a living. But before we go on break, uh, Dr. Tasnim, uh, we said that there's no cure for dementia, but what, what are some of the, let's say, treatments, you know, to put, make them comfortable? What are some of the treatments that are available uh, for dementia patients? There's another side to this challenge that I'd really like to highlight is on the medical practitioner's side of mm -hmm. it. As you heard, they'll go to one, two, three, four doctors, end up at the wrong specialist. Yes. Um, sometimes you're at the neurologist, then you're thrown to the psychiatrist, or you're at the, I don't know, you're at the neurosurgeon. I've seen people from the neurosurgeon. You know, there's a whole wrong triad of where to start. Yes. And I think that would be very important before we even go into treatment. Of yeah. how, how do you even start? Where do you start? Yes, and please. that would probably prevent half the journey that they have gone through mm. if somebody just knew where where to start. Yes. And this is where we say the role of your general practitioner, your family physician, mm. is the most 
a, you know, a most significant role a medical practitioner can play. Because this person has known you since God knows when you were fine. They will have noticed a change even before the family will mm. uh, in cases of medical cases. They'll notice that difference that maybe family members have been taking for granted. Yes. You know, the things that, oh, we saw this with the medical practitioner who is you know, key in understanding, or more specifically, not that I'm trying to sell my work, but oh. a geriatric physician usually looks at these things on your day to day. So when you're a certain age, or when you're dealing with a parent at a certain age, everyone who's aged is, as as, is at risk of dementia. Yes. Some people more than the others. So it's always good to go through these assessments on a regular basis. We oh. say it's very important. Yes, when you're really well, you don't have to go through what we call a full comprehensive assessment. Mm -hmm. It's called a comprehensive geriatric assessment. It looks at different domains, that is physical, medical, social, financial, uh, cognitive, psychological. Mm -hmm. It covers all those areas in very much depth. So you have, in older people, you have different categories. You have the very fit people, then you have the moderately frail, and then you have the terminal cases. They yes. all, all of them would benefit, more so the middle space. Mm -hmm. When you're very well, maybe not so much because all is well and everything's fine and dandy. Yeah. But when you're in that middle hit and miss space, how do you identify the problem? Mm -hmm. How do you get guided rather than going and spending so much resource on doing MRIs and blood tests that cover your head to toe tests, being screened for cancers, being so screened for... So what would for be the, the channel be? How would it look start like if with, someone is... We start, start off with, with your family physician yes. or a geriatric practitioner mm -hmm. or somebody who understands what geriatric medicine is about because that's the best place to start. Yes, yes the neurologist has a role to play. Mm -hmm. Yes, the psychiatrist has a role to play. Mm -hmm. And that's the most important part to understand that this is a multi It's not a it's one a doctor thing. Yeah. Because remember, in all this that they've mentioned, Elizabeth mentioned her father was diabetic. In all this, we've talked about the dementia. What happened to the diabetes? You'd go and fall down because of diabetes, not because of dementia. Mm -hmm. So you need the endocrinologist to also play a role there. But you have to remember, the neurologist might be giving drugs that are interacting with the medications that are being given by the diabetologist. Which, which happens so, so many times. Who's going to look at all this? In the same spectrum, somebody is giving, I mean, one of the most common challenges that, okay, I don't know if you guys faced it, is sleep. Yeah. They lose sleep. They'll wake up at night yeah. thinking it's morning and they want to go home or they want to go on a road trip that they were planning maybe 20 years ago. Mm -hmm. So how do you give them sleep? A doctor will just come and prescribe a sleeping tablet, which is the worst thing you can do for any old person, forget dementia. Mm -hmm. I mean, our psychologist will also tell us that's probably one of the challenges she faces. Somebody on sleeping pills and then they're having problems which are adverse effects of sleeping drugs are the worst thing you can do for older people. Mm -hmm. Yes, when you need to and you have to, there's a way, there's a protocol, the right person should be guiding those processes. Yeah. Not just your, like even I would say, not even the GP should just go and give a sleeping tablet because somebody has come and said, oh, my mom has been awake for three days in a row, rambling on about going to, I don't know, wherever she was going to, which is not even years 20 ago. years ago. And to her, she's traveling today. So she hasn't slept for three days. She's gone on and on. And somebody's just come and put you on a sleeping tablet. By the time I'm seeing them, they've been on a sleeping tablet for six months, and now they're restless. They're still not sleeping well, because sleeping tablets don't give you natural sleep. They don't give you natural sleep. It's yes. like putting a band-aid on a really deep cut and expecting it to stop bleeding. It's not going to stop. You mm. need to stop it from under. Mm -hmm. So the sleeping tablet is an, a nice little cover. Let's cover it up and then yeah. life is going on until it bursts open again. Yeah. And then now there's confusion. They don't want to feed. So something that could have progressed in a much better way has gone wrong. Yeah. Just because it works for Elizabeth's mom or dad, yeah. it won't work for Betty's mom or dad. Yeah. Yes, they can give you the advice because they've journeyed and that's the most important place to learn. But don't do what they did because mm -hmm. these individuals are are like sun and you know, sun They're and moon. Completely different, They're, yeah. Every person is not going to be the same. Mm. So treatment options are usually the two areas. Medical, that's pharmacological and non-pharmacological. We always go the non-pharmacological way first. Mm -hmm. Okay, depending yeah. on dementias, yeah. um, there are certain medicines that are given trials. Mm. I, I emphasize on trials because usually I find patients being on these drugs for years on end, and ideally they should have been on a six to one year trial. Mm -hmm. And apart from that, then they're just on medicines for nothing, mm -hmm. increasing the financial burden to the family. So we'll take a short break and then we'll be back for the question and answer session. Don't go far away.
Welcome back to the second segment of Dada's show. If you're just joining our conversation, you've missed out quite a bit. But don't worry, you can always find all our episodes on YouTube, this and any other show we've done before. If you also want to contribute to the conversation that we are having today, reach us on all our social media platforms at KBC Channel 1. You can reach me directly at Ashiko, the host. The conversation of the day is understanding dementia. And we've been able to scope through the challenges, the symptoms, the signs, and... And we are now giving an opportunity to my wonderful audience to give us their thoughts or to ask us uh, questions in regards to today's topic. So to start us off, uh, we have a question from Daisy. My names are Daisy from Daystar University. Um, my question goes to the psychologist, Miss Sarah. That is, um, how do families with the patients suffering from dementia, how will they manage stress and the burnout and the confusion? That's a really good question, Daisy. And I would say the first thing to realize is that you're human and that you will get tired. And how do you tell that you're not only getting tired, but you're actually burning out mm -hmm. uh, from caregiving? So there's something called caregiver burnout. Mm -hmm. I think before we mitigate, let's briefly say what that is, how yes. it looks like. So there'll be physical fatigue and you feel it in the body, you know, tight shoulders, simple things that even a view at home can start, you know, mm. examining. Can start so examining you have, Yeah, themselves. so you have mm -hmm. very tight shoulders, you know, that are up this way all the time. You have a painful neck. You have a sort of a migraine that never goes away. Mm -hmm. You have backache. That's not just from the physical work, but it is stress that has gone beyond what your mind can bear and mm. is now being deposited into the body. Yeah. Okay, so that's a sign of burnout. Another sign is irritability. If you realize that you have become more irritable lately and uh, you know you have a short fuse yeah. with people around you whether it's at work not just with the patient but even at work in your interactions your fuse has gone short you have caregiver burnout mm -hmm. another one is um resentment some form of resentment with having to play that role of caregiver it doesn't mean you're being a bad person because mm. you're resenting the situation you're just burning out okay now when you start to notice these things the other thing is constantly getting sick yourself. I think that's you're critical. you with the flu. Yeah, you're that never really goes smoke. away. Yeah, that never really goes away. You yeah. know, you have a headache that really never goes away. You have a running stomach. You're actually becoming ill mm -hmm. yourself as a caregiver. That's a sign of burnout. And usually we push it aside and push on with what you have to do. But you need to take note of that. And um, now we go into how do you take care of yourself when you have burnout. Now... If you're ill, go to hospital. Yes. Simple as that. As you're taking your patient to hospital, also mention to, to, to the physician, I have also been experiencing one, two, three. Okay? Uh, another thing that you can do to mitigate stress is take advantage of the people who come and say they want to help. Mm -hmm. You know, people come and say, how can I help? And you tell them, no, 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 I'm fine. I'm okay. Just pray for us. No. The prayers won't come and do the dishes or yeah. buy you diapers. No, 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 no. Ask for actual help. If you have genuine, because we do have genuine friends, I believe, and they mm -hmm. want to help, but you are not telling them how they can show up for you. Tell your friends and your relatives how they can actually show up for you. Make a schedule. Tell them, okay, you want to help? Here's a schedule. Which day of the week are you available to come and how sit for me mm -hmm. as I go catch a trip to the salon yes. to do my hair? I haven't done my hair in six months. Okay, shopping, something like shopping that is not direct help, mm. you see. Put them on a schedule. Let them do the shopping for you. Even if you have the money, sometimes you have the money, you don't have the energy or the mm. time to go out shopping. Which is true. So basically put people on a rotation. Another thing I would encourage is uh, join a group. Mm. Human beings are pack animals and it is high time we appreciate that we are pack animals. Isolation is what kills us. It's not mm. even the problems we have. Mm. It's isolation. When you live in isolation, you die yeah. as a human being. Mm. So look for a group of like-minded uh, or other people who are going through what you're going through who will understand what it is to be in your shoe. Even if they don't have solutions for you, just that aspect of someone knows what I'm talking about. Someone is, can be able to relate. Is very comforting. Mm. It is so, so comforting. Mm. So join a group. We've had there's a group uh, of ad hoc on mm. Facebook, and I'm sure there are others. Join one of those. You'll be surprised how resourceful 
those groups will be mm. for you mm. as a person they'll give you something you didn't even know you were lacking until you join the group yeah. that's what comes top of my mind thank you so so much sir that was so well put you know to do a quick recap delegate taking time for yourself and some good self care and if you're feeling unwell do seek help and join a support group Organizations as such as, uh, such as what Elizabeth has are resource centers. They are places where you can be able to share. You may not be able to get a solution today, but by virtue of just sharing is already, is already enough catharsis. So our next question is from one man Gaddafi. My name is uh, Flint Odero Gaddafi. Mine is a matter of intrigue. I'm just, uh, um, I have a relative actually um, who I think he's not, diag he's not diagnosed, but uh, he's showing a lot of these symptoms. Mm -hmm. And I'm thinking, uh, the, um, with my interactions, mostly I'm seeing uh, it's men who are facing a lot of these problems. Mm -hmm. Is there something like, uh, is there a prevalence um, uh, concerning maybe gender? To, mm -hmm. uh, let's say, is it more prevalent uh, uh, among men? And um, is it also age-related? That's an excellent question, Gaddafi. And I think those are some of the questions, the FAQs that we will also share on our social media platforms in regards to dementia and Alzheimer's. Uh, so I've also heard something about a correlation between menopause and, and, uh, and dementia. So, Dr. please. There is a higher prevalence in women than males. Why, I cannot tell you because there's a lot of unknowns with dementia and Alzheimer's and stuff like that. But it is more commonly in women. We do know that stresses are a high risk, like having a stressful life, early younger life. People who've gone through significant trauma in the younger years are at a higher risk of dementia. When it comes to genetics, yes, there is a genetic predisposition for de uh, dementias but it is in early onset. So if you've had a parent who had an early onset dementia, when we talk about early onset dementia, we're looking at dementia that's earlier than the ages of 60. Yes. So that has a slightly higher genetic pre uh, prevalence. Mm -hmm. When I say that, I don't mean to scare everybody that anybody who's had a parent goes and starts thinking they're getting dementia just yeah, because. Yeah. It just, the risk factor is there, you're just at a slightly higher risk. That doesn't mean you are going to get dementia. Mm. So one thing is I don't want people who lose their keys just once in a while thinking they're getting and dementia. Like, ah, and dementia. They're, they're running around getting MRIs done thinking yeah. they're getting dementia and doing MRIs every year yeah. to rule out dementia or to try and catch it on early. Mm. But uh, when it comes to age, it's really important to remember Yes, as much as dementia is highly prevalent in older people, it can happen in younger people. Mm -hmm. You can have people with the ages of 40, 45 getting dementia. It's not very common, mm -hmm. but that doesn't mean it can't happen. So when you're 45 and having kind of the symptoms we've talked about, please just get it checked. It's yeah. important to remember it can happen to you even as young as 40 or 45. Mm -hmm. It's not only at 60 and plus. Thank you so yes. much, Dr. Terry. I loved what you said. It is not, it's not, uh, it's not been cast on stone. You don't have to, but if you do find yourself falling in any of the brackets that Dr. Terry has mentioned, it's important for you to get checked, especially if you start experiencing any form of symptoms. So our final question of the day is from Brandy. Hello, my name is Brandy. Um, once you start noticing uh, your loved one having signs of dementia or even Alzheimer's or even get diagnosed with it, how do you start planning the care for the loved one? Okay. That's also a very, very good question that I'll pose to Dr. Terry here. You know, what is the advanced planning? Okay, so it's important, like you said, an early diagnosis. Why? Because this is a progressive uh, condition. Mm -hmm. I think we didn't mention that. Dementia starts off very mildly, but over years it is going to progress mm -hmm. to an eventuality where you're unable to do anything for yourself. Mm -hmm. So picking it up early or when it's picked up early is a good place to start what we call advanced directives. Yes. Now what an advanced directive is like having things put into place. It has a medical aspect to it and also a legal aspect to it. And it's usually um, something we call a living will. Mm -hmm. The living will covers a lot of things. It covers how your finances are going to be handled should an eventuality happen or if you're handing it over immediately. Because in the early signs, uh, patients with dementia are still able to make reasonably sound 
uh, decisions, you know, decisions and, and yeah, judgments. Yeah. But if you are in doubt of those, then of course you have to get a letter that states this person is unable to make sound decisions mm -hmm. after an assessment. Mm -hmm. So the first place would be to understand which level they're at. Mm -hmm. Once you have that in place, a patient, uh, a patient usually is advised to handle or hand over all their bank you know banking issues financial matters to another person who they trust mm -hmm. so that's where the legal involvement comes where power of attorney is given or an acting uh, default pay person should it happen this is the person who's going to sign documents make Correct. decisions mm -hmm. the other part of that advanced directive that is very important is the medical side mm -hmm. what is your will for yourself mm -hmm. should i have a stroke should i need a hospitalization should i need resuscitation what do i want for myself and have that legally documented that takes a lot of um, off the burden from the caregivers because mm -hmm. usually with families what i come across a lot of times is in the case of when there's an eventuality that is coming across, like somebody has a heart attack or a stroke, the family members are torn apart. One yeah. of the other reasons families get torn mm -hmm. apart, one will be, let's run to hospital. They'll be like, no, dad didn't want to go to hospital. The other one will be like, then what do we do? So there's always that pull and forth, not knowing what to do, the mm -hmm. confusion that leads to later on, you know, depression and anxiety issues, yeah, because yeah. you're then always left with the question, like, did we do what's correct? Yes. So if this was, you know, put into that plan that should this happen, this is how I would like it. And have that legally documented, signed off by the doctor so that the doctors are also aware mm. that should this happen, this is the will we are going to follow and this is what we are going to do. Mm -hmm. So that you are giving the patient what they would have wanted because sure. now they're no longer in a p place. And ideally the advanced directive is not only for dementia, it's something we say every one of us should have as young as you can. Mm -hmm. Because life is unpredictable. It's always good to know if I got into a road traffic accident today and I was debilitated, I would not want to be alive mm -hmm. on a machine or just there. Let me be. Yeah. But if my family knows that, they're able to make that decision without being emotionally so the traumatized. Does not fall on them. Yes. And, and, and of course, like you said, it will reduce some of the wrangles that families have because everybody knows what they want for you. You know, this was your li this is what you wanted. This were your wishes. But once you have it documented, then it's uh, it's uh, at least it's going to be a guide. Somebody's you know, for your, your wishes. Exactly. So Legally in, in areas protected. Of caregiving, well, how do you go about planning for that? And then the caregiver, that's, um, I mean, we, we want to look at what we talked about earlier, the caregiver burden, because mm -hmm. this takes not one person. Mm -hmm. And usually what happens with families, you have a individual who's left with the direct caregiving. The other one will put in the financial aspect, thinking I've done my part, well, not realizing true. the person who's doing the day to day is under the most strain. Mm -hmm. So it's important to get educated understand your condition, yeah. know what resources are available, knowing there are places you can get cared, uh, skilled caregivers mm -hmm. to come and share that responsibility. So that is their day-to-day -day job. Mm. So you're planning for those expenses as going on. Mm. If you can't afford the caregivers, you can always take, you know, we always have house helps yeah. who we assume are in a good place. And that's a lot of patients. They find themselves in the care of a house help who's not trained. Send the caregiver for an official training. It's uh -huh. a six week training that prepares them on how to take care of this patient yeah. with the right skill. Because a lot of time there's neglect that comes around mm. because of ignorance, caregiver burden. Mm. It's not directly to hurt the patient, but you don't know what you're doing. You don't know what you're doing. Wow. Yeah. That's really excellently put in. And I hope, uh, Brandy, your question has been answered. I think something that's actually, um, you know, stood out is um, when we're talking about, like you very rightfully said, uh, most of the time this burden or this this particular responsibility has fallen on households, especially if we're talking about, you know, machinani and other, it's fallen on the households. And of course, now this lady does not have the particular skill set. So I'm happy to know no, and we'll definitely these are some of the steps that have been taken in regards to this condition. I'm happy to know that there's a training, a six-week training uh, for your care, for your, for your households, which can be able to help them, first of all, not only understand their patient, but also be in a position to take care of them and to give them some form of dignity as they live their life. So we have come to the end of one very interactive, informative, and insightful episode of Data's show. And I'm really hoping that you have been able to grasp as much as you can. So right now, if you know someone, if you're dealing with someone who is suffering from dementia, someone in your, in your family, I believe now you have been empowered with necessary tools that are going to help you at least be able to navigate um, some rough waters. Now, my two cents in all of this is compassion.
Compassion to your patient, compassion to the family, and compassion to the loved ones. And the only way you can be able com to be compassionate enough is to completely load your brain with information and understanding the condition so that you can be in a position to put yourself in their shoes, so they can be in a position to understand what they're going through. And only then will you be able to offer them the support that is necessary. So on behalf of my team, uh, of the team at KBC and my location partner, Best Western Hotel, Upper Hill, Nairobi, and of course my wonderful, wonderful panel and my energetic audience and myself, Ashiko Mbune, I wish you all a compassionate week and I'll catch you same time, same place next week. Bye-bye.